In when we were studying motion, and what I really mean by that is I really mean chapters one, two, and four objects mysteriously, right? They mysteriously all of a sudden started, you know, accelerating. They mysteriously, you know, accelerated. And what do I mean by accelerated? It really means that they suddenly started speeding up or slowing down. The question is, Why do objects accelerate? And I know that a lot of you guys already know, you know, some of the things that we're talking about. And the answer is given by Newton's laws, the laws of everyday physics. Newton's laws tell us why. So what we're saying here is that Newton's laws which are known as the laws of everyday physics, ten, um, answers this question. And what you're gonna see here is that there's some you know, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to throw it out right now. I have a challenge for you. Okay. What we found here that in motion, what we found here is that people had a confusion. Not all the time. There was a confusion between velocity and acceleration. And that's easy to do until you get a, a handle. But there's a huge one that's going to be right in your face. In Newton's laws, there's a big confusion between acceleration and this thing called the net force. I think people are gonna struggle big time with the net force. And depending on the situation, you will literally hear people saying force, but they really mean acceleration. And then there's gonna be other situations when they're saying acceleration, but they're really saying force. And part of the problem is everyday language. Everyday language is very, very, very sloppy. Physics is going to make it crystal clear. But I suspect there's going to be growing pains. And so when you look at this chapter, what you're going to see here is that there's really two breakdowns. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to see here is Newton's laws are broken into, should I say classes? Yeah, maybe I should say classes. There's the acceleration equal to zero and this what this really implies here is that we have something called force free motion. That's sort of like the modern day language. The old language is equilibrium. And I should really, you know, textbooks still use it, but there's, there's some people that are saying that we should move away from that. So there's force free motion. And force-free motion seems 
you know, if you're not experienced with it, it's a little bit odd. And it doesn't mean that there's no forces acting on an object. It just means that the net force is zero. And if you have this kind of motion, what it's really telling us is that you're in a state of motion of rest or constant velocity. And you're going to see, we're going to spend a lot of time on this because there's a lot of really, really good physics here. And so that means if you are at rest or constant velocity, you are in a free, uh, force-free state of motion. If you are not in a state of force-free motion, then you are accelerating. That means in this motion, you are actually being forced. You're in forced motion. And forced motion is called equilibrium. And what you're gonna find here is that when we start to look at this case, this literally means you are now accelerating. And there is a fine line between being at rest and constant velocity and accelerating. It really is. And so what Newton's laws, it essentially takes this whole chapter and it essentially breaks it up into these two pieces. And the first one I want to go after without any doubt is Newton's first law. Newton's first law is powerful. It's this beautiful, beautiful little law. And I want to jump into that guy ASAP because there's a lot of counterintuitive things about Newton's first law. And that's what we want to get to. So what you're going to see here is Newton's first law. What it really tells us is it tells us about um, the coordinate system. where Newton's laws are valid. And then you have Newton's second law. And what Newton's second law does is it tells us why objects accelerate. And then there's the elusive Newton's third law. And Newton's third law, what it does here is it tells us how objects interact. So in summary, this is a very, you know, very brief description of them, but that's essentially what we want to do. We want to set up the coordinate system. What does it mean to be in that coordinate system? And then we go on to look at why objects accelerate. And then finally, we hit the last piece that tells us how objects interact with each other. So Newton's first law. So the acronym that is common for all of Newton's laws, since this is Newton's first law, it's typically abbreviated with N1L. So that's where we want to start with, right there. So here we go. So what we want to do is we want to go in and we want to say, ask us, what does Newton Newton's first law say? So what does N1L tell us? Well, let's start off with the first thing. What it does here is it defines what are called inertial or natural states of motion. So inertial 
or natural states of motion. So what is a natural state of motion? So natural state of motion means states of zero acceleration. There's only two ways that you could be zero acceleration. This implies here that the object must be either at rest or constant velocity. You could only be in these two states. So I'm typically not going to write constant velocity this way. I'm just going to write V equal to a constant just because it's easier to write. Okay, so it defines inertial states of motion or natural states of motion two. And it says here that Newton's laws are only valid when the measurer is, is in an inertial frame of reference. Okay, so what's inertial? Inertial is the same as natural. That means that frame must be at rest or it must be moving at constant velocity. So what do I mean by that here? Well, here's what I mean. So what I wanna do here is that I wanna look at two frames of reference. So here I go. So you could imagine that I'm, here's the ground and then here's the ground. And I could imagine that I have a person And so here's this person. And what I know about this person here is that this person is at rest. And that means that this person is at rest relative to the ground. So that means when this person carries their little coordinate system of y and x, that coordinate system is at rest relative to the ground. That's an inertial observer. But you could imagine now that there's a second person on a skateboard. And so when I look at this person here, right, as they're standing, and moving on the skateboard, we know for a fact that this person here is moving at constant velocity. So what we say here is that they're moving at constant velocity relative to the ground. So that means as they carry their little coordinate system, this coordinate system is moving with V equal to a constant. So Newton's laws say that if you have an observer that's at rest or moving at constant velocity it, with their coordinate systems, then Newton's laws are valid. So that means we can apply Newton's laws because they are valid. 
However, if an observer is accelerating, and what do I mean by accelerating? Speeding up, slowing down. If they are accelerating. So in this case here, I now have an observer that's, let's say, speeding up. So we're looking at this thing here. And now I, th I think about my the skateboard situation. And I have this woman on the skateboard that's now accelerating. That means that the velocity and the acceleration is this way. Because this is the case, what we say here, this is a non-inertial observer. And because it's a non-inertial observer, they cannot apply Newton's, Newton's, uh, Newton's laws. They won't be valid in this situation. So Newton's first law really says two different things here. It defines these natural states of motion. Then it says only particular types of observers, inertial observers, will be able to say, will be able to apply Newton's laws and be successful in describing what they observe. If you have an accelerated observer, a non-inertial observer, speeding up or slowing down, if they apply Newton's laws, they're gonna get nonsensical answers. So that's what I wanna focus on. So let's go write. So what I'm gonna write to begin with is that I'm gonna write Newton's laws in a physical form, not where it includes coordinate systems, because that would mean that we'd have to do what are called transformations between one coordinate system and another. And that's something that I'm not interested. So what I'm gonna do here is that I'm going to explain Newton's first law through physical interpretation not mathematical because this requires transformations of coordinate systems and there's you could do that and if you take like, um, you know, if we had enough time, I would definitely go through with it. But it, it turns out that it skews the physics and I'm most interested in physics. So here I go. Newton's first law. And this is what Newton's first law says. And I'm gonna say it as easy as possible. It says objects at rest or moving at constant velocity will remain in these states of motion forever. Objects at rest or moving at constant velocity will remain in these states of motion forever. Okay. If they are not in one of these 
states of motion a net force is forcing these objects to change their states of motion. So if you are not at rest, if you are not at constant velocity, then something is forcing you to change your state of motion. And so when we say change, what we really mean, speeding up or slowing down. That's Newton's first law right there. Okay, that is Newton's first law. And so one of the things that I really, really got to get a handle on is this guy right here. Right? The net force. That's what we really got to gotta start talking about this thing. Because the net force is the only thing that objects actually feel. So... Let's go look at that. So there's Newton's first law. So I want to make a remark about this. And it's, it's, it's actually quite a shock if I can say this. Okay. So my remark about The net force. The remark is that objects only care about the net force and not individual ones. So objects only care about the net force. not about individual forces. In fact, you'll hear me say objects only feel the net force. In fact, I'm going to do this because that is a very important statement. So what do I mean by this? You could imagine that I have a surface. And I have a block on the surface here. So let's say that this is my block right here. Now, as I look at this block here, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna take the force of my hand and I'm gonna apply a force on this thing. So I come in here with my hand and I'm applying a force and I'm forcing this object to slide across the table. But wait a minute, if it's sliding across the table, what you really sense in here is that down here between the block and the table, is the force of friction. So even though I'm moving in this direction, the frictional force, right? The frictional force, what we find here is that friction is a rough surface force. We haven't even defined what a force is. But I think that we could we can agree here is that we know that there's something that's always opposing this thing. 
So what I'm saying here is that why do objects only feel the net force? Because as a block slides across the table, one can never just ignore friction. It's part of the system, right? You could never ignore friction. So what you're finding here is that the net force accounts for all forces acting on an object. And so what I'm really saying is that if I look at the net force, what I'm seeing here is that there's two competing forces. There's the force of my hand that's going in one direction. And then there's the force of friction. And in this case here, they're opposing each other, right? And what you're seeing here, what I'm saying here is that this is the only thing the block feels, right? Like blocks have feelings, but the fact is this, you cannot separate these forces ever. And because you can't separate them ever, the only thing the block feels is the difference between those two forces. So a net force doesn't say that there's no forces acting on an object. All it's saying here is that you have to include all of the forces and all of these forces act as one. And when they act as one, that's when I say that objects only feel the net force. So what I wanna do here is that I wanna go and start to interpret. What does Newton's first law say here? So here we go. So let's go look at the interpretation of the physics of Newton's interpretation of Newton's first law. So the first thing that we should say here is that it says that if an object is either at rest or constant velocity, no net force is required to be in this state, right? So if an object is either rest slash constant velocity, this implies no net force is required to be in this state. So what do I mean by this picture-wise? Well, what I mean by this in terms of picture-wise is that we could look at this in, in a couple of ways. You could imagine that I have my surface, right? Here's my surface right here. And on the surface here, what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna put a water bottle down here. So if this is my water bottle, of course it's filled with water here. Now, if you place a water bottle on the table and nobody moves it, that water bottle is gonna stay on the table forever, right? If nobody moves the water bottle, it's going to be there. That means here, it's going to stay there forever. And what we say then, because nobody's moving that water bottle, that implies 
that it's in what? Forced free motion. There's no net force required to keep it there. No net force required to keep it there. Okay. No surprise. What's surprising is our next situation. Now you could imagine that we have an ice rink, right? So in this scenario here, we have an ice rink. So when I'm thinking about this ice rink, we're talking about what? Frictionless ice. And what I'm gonna put on this ice rink here is that I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna put, let's say, a hockey puck. And somebody smacks the hockey puck and all we know is that this hockey puck is doing what? It's moving at constant velocity, right? So it's moving at constant velocity. Now imagine that if I truly have frictionless ice, if I hit a hockey puck, is it gonna go to the other side of the rink? The answer is yes. But what if this rink was, let's say, five, five miles long? If I hit this thing and it's truly on frictionless ice, Will this puck make it all the way to the five mile in? The answer is absolutely yes. So the question is, what is forcing this object to keep moving at constant velocity? The answer is nothing. What's gonna happen? This thing is gonna stay moving at constant velocity forever. Why is it gonna continue to keep moving at a constant velocity? Because there's no net force required to be in this state. And what a lot of times people forget about is that sitting water bottles, you kind of say like, well, of course it's not gonna move. Yeah. And people miss the fact that you could be moving at constant velocity. And if you're moving at constant velocity, then that means there's still no force required. It's in a zero acceleration state of motion here. And so what we wanna do here is that we sort of wanna keep thinking about in this language. But if we're in this language here, but then check this out. If the water bottle is not at rest, then something forced it to move, right? If you put the water bottle down and somebody comes and takes it, somebody forced it to move. And what that means here is that means that the net force in this case is not zero. Somebody forced it. And if the net force is not zero, then it must be in an accelerated state of motion. And if it's in an accelerated state of motion, that means it has to be speeding up or slowing down, right? It has to be, in order to move it, somebody had to speed it up to get it to move. The same thing with the, uh, with the puck here. If the puck, is not at constant velocity, 
then something forced it to, let's say, slow down, right? If it was moving at constant velocity and it suddenly starts to slow down, we know that something is forcing it to slow down. So in this case, what would it be? It would be friction. So once again, this tells us here that the net force is not zero. And as a consequence, it's now slowing down. Newton's first law is very, very clear. It's either at rest forever or it's moving at constant velocity forever. If it's not, something is forcing it to do that. So, hey, Carlos. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What role does gravity play in Newton's first law? Well, in this case, gravity, I mean, if you look at the, the puck, for example, or, or the water bottle, gravity actually has no role in the sliding puck. Actually, can I erase what I just said? That's not true. And, you know, th this is a little bit getting ahead of us, but if you, you look at this thing and we ask the question, why is it that the water bottle is, water bottle is stationary? Well, for starters here, we know that it's at a table. So we know that the table must be pushing it up. So the only way that table is, not, the only way that could happen here is that there's a balance between the force of gravity and the table. So it's sort of like gravity is playing the balancing role of keeping it there. And that's the same thing with the puck. That's the role that gravity would play in this role right here. Let's finish this example. And what we're doing here is that what we're really doing is that we're looking at this situation where you're pushing a block with your hand and then you suddenly stop pushing. That means you remove your hand. So you could imagine that on the picture to the left, there's the force of my hand. And then what's opposing this is the force of friction. So if this is moving at constant velocity, then we know that the acceleration is zero, but if the acceleration is zero, then that means that there's no net force to keep it at constant velocity. And it will always move at constant velocity unless something forces it to change. So now there's a period where you remove your hand. So the moment that you remove your hand, it was moving at constant velocity. But then it starts to slow down. Why did it start to slow down? Because what's causing it to slow down is the force of friction, right? That's what's happening. So in other words, does this violate Newton's first law, right? Because it's not moving at constant velocity. It's not moving and it's not at rest. It's slowing down. So what this tells us here is that this does not violate Newton's first law. Why? Because now there is a net force in the force of friction. And this thing is not zero. I can't take friction away. So therefore, the object, the block, Um, is accelerating, in this case, slowing down. And therefore, being forced to decelerate. And that's exactly what Newton's law is actually telling us. So what I want to do here is that I want to continue with these examples because that's a fairly light one. Let's go into some deeper ones. Okay.
And what we want to do here is we want to know what happens in these two situations. So the question that I'm asking is that what happens to a passenger in a car when they suddenly stop and they turn the car. So those are the two that I really want to go in and look at these things. So let's look at that. So the first one that I want to look at is that I want to ask, so it's really a question that I want to answer. And the question goes like this. When a car suddenly stops slash slows down, you move forward relative to the seat. My question is, why? So let's start to draw, drive our cars and here we go. So the first thing that I want to do here is that I imagine that you're in your car and you're driving, right? So you're coming in, there's your car, and then you have, of course, a passenger. You're the passenger in the car. And since you have the top down, your hair is flying all over the place. So what I, when I'm thinking about this scenario here, what you're seeing here is that as this car is moving, I'm assuming that you're gonna be moving at a constant velocity. And for the sake of argument, let's say that you're moving at 50 miles an hour. So the car is moving at 50 miles an hour. So the question, how fast is the person moving? Well, if the car is moving at 50 miles an hour, then the speed of the person must also be 50 miles an hour. So now, Newton's law says that in order to be valid, you need an observer. So here I go. Here's my observer here. My observer in blue is a stationary observer. <coughs> so here's my observer at rest, right? At rest relative to the ground. He's at rest relative to the ground. So this immediately says that for this observer, Newton's laws are valid. And when I say Newton's laws are valid, what that really means that there is a cause and effect, okay? That something is causing something to happen. Okay, so what does this observer see? Well, now what happens here is that there's this period where now you're seeing breaking. So if you're breaking, here's what you find. That car is now going to be what? Slowing down. So when I look at this car, What you're seeing here is that this car now is doing what? There is, it has slowed down. It has gone from 50 miles an hour, let's say to 40 miles an hour. 
So when you're looking at this person, what is this person doing here? As this person, note that the car has changed the speed, but the person is following Newton's first law. And Newton's first law says that this person will move at 50 miles an hour, no matter what. So when I'm looking at this person, this is V of the person here, that velocity of the person does not change. So according to Newton's first law here, why does the person move forward while well, they're braking here is that Newton's first law then claims what? That you're moving that the, the person is moving faster than And the car, no problem. Newton's law says, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. So that's why you move forward because an observer on the ground clearly shows that you're moving faster than the car. I noticed I didn't put a Y here, so let me put a Y. So then what about from a different frame of reference? Okay, so now what we're going to ask is here, what about if we have, the, what about if the observer is in the frame of the car? What, what actually happens in this case here? So what I really mean by this here is that now I have the same situation and I have my car again. Okay, so here's my car. And what's happening here is that this car is again, right? It's traveling at 50 miles per hour. And then I'm gonna have a situation again where this car slows down to 40 miles an hour. And so we now know that there's a difference in speed here. And again, we have our observers in here, right? Here, here's the observer in the car. Excuse me, that's not the observer, that's the person driving the car. Where is the observer now? What we're seeing here is that the observer is traveling in the car. And I'll put them on top of the car because we're actually kind of looking at this situation. So what is happening here? So what does the blue observer see here? The observer sees the pink person suddenly accelerate in the forward direction for no reason. So the blue observer sees the pink person suddenly, suddenly accelerate in the forward um, direction. Hey, Carlos. Yeah. The rate of acceleration of the pink person would be dependent upon delta V or like change in velocity, right? So. Right, over the time interval. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. So the blue observer sees the pink person suddenly accelerate in the first direction. Now, remember what I said here. And what I said here 
very, very importantly, Newton's laws are about cause and effect. So now the question is, what is the cause of acceleration? And the blue person says, nothing. I see nothing forcing the acceleration. It's almost like a bewitch situation or some type of voodoo situation where this person suddenly accelerates for no reason. And so from this viewpoint, right, it almost, it's what? It's magical why it's happening. So the conclusion is you come back and you go like, there's nothing that's making this, this person accelerate in the forward direction. This, what we say then is that this non inertial observer. And remember what we said about non inertial That means this is in an accelerated frame of reference. And because it's in an accelerated frame of reference, this blue observer cannot say why. We see no cause for the acceleration. So the conclusion is, since Newton's laws are about cause and effect, what we say then that this observer says is that Newton's laws are not valid in non-inertial frames. So if the observer is accelerating, they cannot apply Newton's laws because you can have no cause and effect. So one of the things that I forgot to mention here is that I should have had acceleration going in that direction. <clears throat> and if the car is accelerating, which I forgot to put over here, if the car is accelerating in this direction, well, What we've said here is that if the acceleration is not zero, then that implies that there's a net force that's not zero. So we conclude if there's acceleration, there must be something forcing this thing to decelerate. Something must be forcing this thing to decelerate. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because you could see that this is clearly Newton's first law at its best right here. But you can only apply it if the observer's in a frame of reference that's at rest or moving at constant velocity. The same thing happens, but if you're not, then you can't talk about cause and effect. So the same thing actually happens with, uh, this other scenario here. And this question, which is very similar to what we've just talked about, is this. When a car makes a sharp turn, your body slides towards, I wanna say the door. It's not necessarily the door, but it slides to one side of the car, okay? Again, the question that we're asking, why? Okay, so let's do this. So what I'm gonna give you here is I'm gonna give you a top view And when I'm thinking about the top view, I'm really thinking about the fish hook 
on highway one. And that's that big turn as let's say you're driving towards downtown Santa Cruz at the end of highway one, or you're, you're going to Costco or whatever it is that you're going. So what I imagine here is that I wanna do a top view. And so what I'm imagining here is that there's this turn that's looking like this here. And what I'm imagining here is that there's a car. There's a car on the road, right? It has its tires. Maybe this is a, a red car this time. And I could imagine that this is the roof of the car right there. And so let's look at the speed of the car. So if you're on the fish hook, let's say that you're traveling 40 miles an hour on the fish hook. By the way, that's illegal. What's the actual speed limit when you get onto the fish hook? It's 20 miles an hour. But I don't really need to know that you're speeding and breaking the law as driving on the fish hook. So what we imagine here is that this is the speed of the car. And because the person is also in the car, this person also is moving at the same speed. So now what happens here? Well, Newton's first law tells us what? Tells us that, that if the person is moving at constant velocity, um, let me write that different. It says that if you're moving at V equal to a constant, then you will forever, right? So check this out. What happens? What happens is, is that now the car, in order to stay on the road, must what? Has to turn. So when you're looking at this car, what you're seeing here is that the car direction has changed because you had to take the steering wheel. But the velocity of the person continues to move where? in the same direction. And since the velocity of that person is still moving in the same direction, you're moving towards the direction of the door. So therefore, it makes sense. So if I have my little blue observer again, my little blue observer relative to the earth is saying like, well, yeah, of course the person moves towards the door. They were always moving towards the door. It's just, that the, excuse me, they were always moving straight. It's just that the car changed direction. And because the car changed direction, of course the person is sliding towards the door. Classic Newton's first law application here. But if the observer was on the car, from a non-inertial frame. That means, what about the person on the side here? The person slides towards the door for no reason whatsoever, right? There's no cause. That person does not realize that there has to be a cause that they're going like, wait, what's pushing me? What's pushing me towards the door? There's nothing acting on me. And so we conclude here that Newton's laws are not valid because there is no cause.